Welcome to our special Valentine's Day edition of the AUSA Coffee Series, featuring the Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston. Thank you for being here. It's great to see everyone. My name is Alex Brody. I am the Director of Meetings here at AUSA. And before I introduce SMA Daily, I do want to thank our four-star sponsors, Leonardo DRS and General Dynamics, as well as our two-star sponsor, Northrop Grumman, for their support. Let's give our sponsors a big round of applause. We cannot do these events without our sponsors. So if you are interested in being a sponsor, please see either Gay Hudson or Emily Call. Emily is here out in the registration area. Please stop by after the event and speak with her. We do appreciate the presence of the general officers and command sergeants majors joining us this morning as well. It's always great to have you here. Thank you. And I'd also like to acknowledge our congressional staff on this very special day. Your efforts on behalf of the Army, soldiers, and families is greatly appreciated. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the vice president of NCO and soldier programs for the Association of the United States Army. Please put your hands together for the Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. So I don't get in trouble because I mess this up every year. Mrs. Daly works here at AOSA, so happy Valentine's Day, Mrs. Daly. <laughs> and SMA, thanks for giving us your time today. It's always an honor and a privilege to have you back with us here, and you've always supported us for these coffee series and new reports, and even through COVID, when we <laughs> were doing them virtually together. So we appreciate you being with us today. So before we get started, I'm gonna just open up the floor and let the 16th Sergeant of the Army open with a few words, SMA. Well, I guess I got to say happy Valentine's Day to Mrs. Daly also. I guess. <laughs> and if my wife is out there listening, I love you and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's not listening. I think she's going for a run or something. So uh, um, really, uh, thanks for spending some time with us. And another special thanks to all those soldiers we have forward deployed. I think sometimes... You know, as we look and we think we're having breakfast here, we, we still have a lot of soldiers that are forward deployed. And we still got soldiers in Iraq. We got soldiers in Syria. Um, we also have a lot of soldiers over in Europe. And so we deployed uh, a core. At some point, we had two cores out of the four that we had forward deployed. Um, but right now, we still got fifth corps over there, two divisions, and a bunch of brigades and soldiers. So while we're sitting here, uh, saying happy Valentine's Day. Let's please remember all those soldiers we have for deployed. So, um, so uh, I'm really proud of them and happy to be here with you on Valentine's Day. Well, thank you, SMA, and we appreciate your presence. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to start thinking about your questions now. I've got a few questions for the SMA, and we're not going to let them uh, take it easy. We're going to we're going to jump right in SMA and, and, and take some tough challenges here. Uh, I, I like hard questions. That's hard so. questions. That's right. Um, no softballs. We've had some issues. None from you, though. Yeah. <laughs> we've had a tough time with recruiting uh, yeah. this past year and, and, and leading up to this, we had. Let's just be honest. And uh, I know the Army's been working on a lot of things to combat that. Um, can you talk about some of those things they're doing and, and then give us an idea of where we're going to be here for the year? <laughs> uh, oh, we're we're going to have 70,000 in sessions. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> No. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's, I, I need all your help with that. So that's, that's where we really want to go. Um, yeah. We had a tough year last year. We cannot do that again this year. Uh, that's number one. So we've got a ton of efforts going on. Number one, just uh, announce is, uh, you know, the soldier program where you, if you uh, want to recruit one of your buddies come in, um, you know, you get promoted. With that, we had that program before. This wasn't anything new. We kind of dusted it off and said uh, the soldier referral program is actually what's called. Um, we've got that initiative going on. We're looking at how we can actually help our recruiters too, because they're out there alone and unafraid. You look at COVID's going on, and you know inflation's going up. How can I make sure a soldier that's out there in recruiting out in New York City can they afford now? So mm -hmm. you know if you're trying to figure out where you're going to live. Uh, it's hard to recruit. So we're doing things for the recruiters, but number one, uh, we got to get their sessions going. Um, soldier referral program, we looked at bonuses. We're looking at, do you want to have your station of choice coming out of basic training? You know, that's something we haven't done in a long time. It's like, hey, I want to go here. So we've got 
a lot of initiatives. We got a whole laundry list. We have the Army Recruiting Task Force that are looking at that. But in strength, as everyone would know, is a you know it's a culmination of not just accessions but also retention. And the good news about that is our retention numbers have stayed steady or higher than they ever have been. And what that tells us is we just need to get people into the, the military and the Army. And once they get in, they want to stay. So they like it. So a lot of people say, oh, they're leaving the Army. No, it's, they, they leave, but at the same rate that we've always been. So we don't have a lot, a lot of people leaving the Army that don't normally leave. So when they come in, people want to stay. They join the organization they want to be a part of. So we just need everyone's help out there talking um, to everyone, saying, here's – what's good about your military. Here's what's good about your army that you're not seeing in the paper. Um, and that's where we need help. I need everybody's help. I need the young people in here. I need to talk to other young people and all the seasoned folks in their own season <laughs> veterans. <laughs> so, I need you to talk to the parents. And, and that's, it's a, it's, uh, it's a, you know, multiple ways to look at it is, uh, a young man or woman may want to come in, uh, but the parents will say, oh, well, you're going to come out with some ailment or something's going to be wrong with you. I'm like, nah, not really. <laughs> so that's where I would ask your, for your help. So, Major, we saw you put in a program where it's kind of like the pre-basic training. Can you talk about how that's been going and some of the results of it? I know we've been doing it for a while now. Yeah, the Future Soldier Prep Course, really proud of that. I went down, the chief and I both went down uh, – uh, a couple of times to uh, Fort Jackson, looking to expand that Fort Benning. You know, do we need to do it at Fort Sill and other locations? And it's just soldiers come in and they get a couple of weeks. It depends on how long they go. If you can go up to 90 days. And this is like the trial. You know, can we raise your GT score? Can we get your fitness level a little higher? And we've seen a lot of success out of this program. Soldiers are coming out of that, going straight into basic training. They're being the leaders in basic training. They have a very high success rate to get through basic training. So they're not, uh, not failing out of basic training as much. So we're extremely excited. Uh, we're looking to expand that. And it's a great program. It's giving you know, young men and women an opportunity to, to succeed to serve our yeah, and serve our country. Yeah, Excellent. Probably one of the most asked questions when you're the Sergeant Major of the Army by our soldiers is, when are we going to make changes to the body composition program? And if you were at annual meeting, and you should have been, and if you weren't, you're going to need to be there this year, you would know that the SMA announced that there's going to be some changes coming to the Army body composition program. And you talked a little bit about that, but can you tell us what those changes are and when do you think they're going to go in place? Yeah, right now, the, the <laughs> biggest one is the 540 on the ACFT. Uh, the Army directive is being staffed right now. And I'll say 540 on the ACFT. So what, I, what we announced was if I scored 540 on the ACFT, we're going to weigh height um, and weight and body composition. And some people uh, would say, you know, why are you doing that? Well, what we found is most people that score at that, you know, don't need to be taped anyway. So I was like, sorry. But, but what we, so is it easy to score 540? Yeah, it's not easy. Not so easy. <laughs> everybody in here scores 540, right? So, um, <laughs> yes. So um, that's number one. And what it is, is we've also found that there could be a, a small group when you're taped uh, on the old tape test is that if you were taped, you would actually tape over. But when we put the study showed that when we put those individuals on uh, either a DEXA, a scanner, or if we did an in body, they actually met tape. And the the largest group of that uh, were in the 540 range. We said, well, you score 540, then we'd wave height and weight and the body fat. It was science. It was based on the study. It wasn't Sergeant Major in the Army sitting there just making it up. So uh, we've got two more changes that we're looking to do. Um, that, and let's go back to 540, the Army directive should be out. And my goal is to get that done. Uh, well, we got two weeks and left in the month. So we'll say by March. <laughs> So it's got to go through the staff. Give you, always give yourself. Yeah, I get, yeah, I got to give me an extra. So um, that should be complete in March. And we have two more changes that we're looking to do um, in, before April. So uh, we got a couple more things to do. too. That's my next question. This subject, we have not sat down together or did a podcast without having the conversation about the next subject I'm about to say. 
ACFP. <laughs> it's like, now I know that's you didn't the, want to leave with that. That's the gift the previous, <laughs> SMA, gift the previous SMA handed to you. To, yeah, uh, appreciate it. But you know, it seems we finally got <laughs> we finally got an ACFT. Yes. And Congress came back in this NDAA and announced some changes. Can you tell us what those are and how we're going to implement them? So, I'm very excited to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. Um, yes. Yeah, so they wanted us to go back and look at combat arms, and that's what we originally were looking at. It's um, a gender neutral test for combat arms. So the good news about that, we just dusted off what we had. So right now there's kind of two proposals. Do you go with the Army combat fitness test and say, here's what the minimum standard would be for combat arms? Like we had before, we already had this, you can look it up. Um, so here's a ACFT men's score. We don't know what, exactly what that is. We, we got to get more people taking the ACFT. Then we got to look at that combat arms, you know, 11 Bravo, just take one. And say, oh, here's what it is, and draw a line. Or do we do a separate test? You know, uh, do you say, okay, the physical assessment, is this what uh, that's going to look like? Um, none of that's been approved. All that's being talked about. That's what I'm kind of working on is those are, those are a couple other options that we have in there, but those are the two big ones that we're looking at. Baselining an ACFT uh, score that's age and gender neutral for combat arms, um, and then you got to validate that. Or do you do a test that looks like, Hopefully a bunch of things you would do in combat. The good news is that uh, very soon, or right now, we just changed the expert infantry badge, physical assessment. And we could use that as a model. The physical assessment for expert infantry badge is now one mile run. You do in kit with the helmet. I call it the dome of obedience will be worn. So you have a helmet, your, your plate carrier, and your OCPs in boots. You run one mile. You do 30 push-ups, you do a sprint, and you do sandbags, you do a high crawl, you do a buddy rush, you do a farmer's carry, and then you do another one-mile run. And then after that assessment, then you can start your EFB. And that may be one of the things we may look at, but that's not determined yet. But if anybody in here would like to try that, let me know. We'll set it up for you. <laughs> now, you had mentioned even during the annual meeting that because you just mentioned the expert entry, but now you have a new program called E3B. Yeah. So does a physical assessment for three, well, maybe you should explain E3B again for the, yeah. the group, but also will that physical assessment be consistent across the, the field? Yes. Uh, yeah. So all three badges will do that physical assessment. And that's been our goal. Now, they may not have the same standards. So, and, you know, don't come after me. Okay. So the, the EIB, so the infantry soldiers would have a higher standard standard or a faster score to get through that one mile and that assessment. And then there may be a different standard for the expert field medical badge, which is the other badge. So that's two. And then the three is the expert soldier badge. So they would all have the same physical standard. And I just told you what it was, but they may be, well, if you're going for EIB, you may have to do it in 22 minutes. Not that fast. <laughs> I think we're looking at 27. And then if you're going for expert field medical badge, maybe 30 minutes. Um, so we're, we're getting all that aligned. So when you go out to a site and you call it E3B, you can say, hey, you may have some infantry specific tasks you need to do, uh, but some of them are common. And then you may have a soldier badge and there'll be common tasks there, but it looks very similar. Or, and then there's a medical lane if you're going for your expert field medical badge. So getting all those aligned has been a project we've been working on and I'm really excited about that. And that's going to save some training time because in the past, brigades would have to set these up individually, find time throughout the training calendar year, and then units are responsible for running three three separate things, and they can combine these. So it'll actually save some time, right? Yeah, it, it saves a lot of time. You set it up once, and then other units can come to that. And it's for most people in your organization. You know, you have a lot of medics in an infantry brigade. So why wouldn't you just, when you do your expert infantry badge, that your medics can go get a medical badge or you have a whole bunch of other soldiers in an infantry brigade why can't i get my expert soldier badge while you're doing your eib we want to be expert in our field and our warrior task and battle drills and how to fight uh, as a soldier and i think everybody should have an opportunity to do that and that saves everybody a lot of time to go do that all right we're going to go out to our audience now for some questions so i know there's some questions out there and alex has got the microphone so ladies and gentlemen if you have a question just get alex's attention and I'll bring you the microphone so you can get the SMA uh, to answer that question for you. Sky Soldiers, 
Um, good morning, everyone. I, uh, I uh, served in Vietnam from May 65 to May of 67 with the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and I'm proud of it. And it was probably one of the best uh, moves my mother ever made, was <laughs> giving me, getting me out of the house and in the service. And as I'm sitting here thinking about this and talking to you, uh, there used to be infomercials about the Marines, but I haven't seen an infomercial about the Army. Why not be an Army guy? And um, and then uh, I, I don't. I live in Philadelphia, and there's lots of crime and lots of this and lots of that, but there's no Army presence out in the community. And so if you want to talk to me about how to make that happen, I'd be more than happy to have that happen. But I think the Army's got to get out of the barracks and into the community. And that way you <coughs> have a greater outreach to people that you want to join. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, I've been out there. I was out in Veterans Day. Uh, I think we were in we're a couple states. Um, we're always going somewhere. Been to Chicago a couple of times. Uh, um, looking to go to anywhere you want me to go. But we also have a formal program with Forcecom, our you know largest owner of individual soldiers, has partnered with USREC to get our soldiers out there. And we do as many as community engagements that we can do. And we really need everybody to get out much further away from the bases. You can't just stay and talk to the people in Fayetteville. Most people in Fayetteville, you know, probably, you know, kind of we're in the military. So we're looking for outreach and any opportunities we, we get our soldiers out. We're all in. And thank you for your service uh, and what you did in Vietnam. We would most of the people in this room would not be here and be alive today be, uh, without your service. So thank you. Sir, can we talk a little bit about uh, Ukraine? Um, as you know, the war in Ukraine has been ongoing and has had a major escalation persisting since uh, February of 2022. How is our army providing uh, support? Well, first of all, I, I want to just say how proud I am of the Army. And when you look at what we've done in the last four years, we've had a couple, you know, significant emotional events. So uh, we'll start with uh, Killed Soul Mating. You know, that's how we started 2020. <laughs> so uh, then we had COVID, we had hurricanes, forest fires, civil unrest, a little thing called election. Um, then we had all these other things going on in, in, the, in the country. And then all that. You know, and then we left Afghanistan, then we went back to Afghanistan, and then February 22. I'm be honest, when February 22 and Russia invaded Ukraine, we're like, okay, we know how to do that. <laughs> so all the other, some of the other things that happened in the first three years, I, I wasn't sure about. Um, like, what do you do with the virus? I'm not sure. But uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, your army knew exactly what we needed to do. And you should be extremely proud of what we've, the support we've done. Um, we deployed the, the 82nd for like their fourth no notice deployment, um, which most people go, yeah, that's what the 82nd does. But so let's talk about the first brigade of third ID. So first brigade of third ID deployed an armored brigade combat team in seven days were in Grafenbeer, Germany, seven days. They were in Grafenbeer, Germany, shooting tanks and Bradleys to make sure um, we were ready. And that brigade was not on the immediate response force. Uh, that brigade, three months earlier, had just come back from Korea. So we have supported by sending troops there to reassure our partners and allies over in Europe. Uh, we also give all the, the support that we've been directed to give. Uh, I think the latest you've heard is uh, tanks. Um, but we've been given uh, anything that we are directed to give. And we provided that. More importantly, uh, Army, Army Materiel Command, led by General Daly, has done a phenomenal job. Uh, anytime we say they need this in equipment, and normally General Daly says it's, it's on the way, here's where it's at, and here's what we can do with it. So we have continued to provide support um, through logistics and our troops, and then lastly is what we're doing for our training. And I was just there in Grafenbeer, Germany in February, January, in January, and look at what they're doing with air defense training, what they're doing with the Bradleys. And I can, I can honestly say the Ukrainians have uh, a huge will to fight. They, their instructors were sitting there and it's like, don't, don't teach us all how to do this. Teach the instructors 
So I'm Ukrainian. I want to teach my people so that I go back and I know what I'm doing on this uh, equipment training, whether it's air defense, Bradley's or medical. They were really motivated that uh, motivated by doing what they wanted to do so they could get back into the fight. And I'm extremely proud of the Ukrainians uh, and what they're doing. But I'm also uh, extremely proud of our soldiers and getting rallied around that mission. Anything they've been asked to do. Oh, thanks, SMA. <clears throat> Uh, so, a uh, couple of questions. One, uh, any changes on the horizon in NCOES? And uh, kind of a follow-up to your uh, your last comments there. Are we seeing any challenges in training in our formations that are not deployed as a result of the logistics support we've been providing? Yeah. Um, first, the first question, NCOES, yes. Mostly what I want to change is the basic leader course. So... Uh, we look at a few years ago, we went to a 22-week OSUT for 11 Bravos. Um, we haven't changed the, the amount of time we've spent on our basic NCOs in a long time. We actually made it a little shorter. I think we went from 30 days to 21 and out. I want to take it back to 30. Right now, we're going to bring back Land Nav. Um, we took that out uh, for all the right reasons, and now we're going to put it back for all the right reasons. <laughs> so uh, that's already started. Uh, we've run like four pilots to bring uh, Land Nav. Uh, we took out a field training exercise. We're going to put that back in. We're making. We're going to make our NCOs um, as as well. They're better than our soldiers anyway. But what we need to do is continuously challenge our NCOs at the basic leader course. So that's one of the biggest changes. To make that in our first NCO course uh, rigorous and bring back a little bit more of the rigor and the field time and the tactics in uh, the basic leader course. And that will be most of that will be completed. Uh, either at the end of this physical year or the next physical year. And that's probably one of the biggest changes that I've got going in uh, NCOES. Um, now, for uh, have we seen any degradation uh, in our training by all the stuff that we've given? Right now, no. So we continue to do our training. Uh, if you look at howitzers, you know, we've got, you know, other howitzers um, that are all over the place. And I can say that because I'm at 13 Bravo. So, um, yeah, the good yeah. news, yes, uh, as, as you train on artillery, artillery skills uh, can be trained on whether you're trained on 777 or 119. So we're, right now, we've seen no degradation in what we've done. Um, we continue to train and, and be ready for whatever we've called to do. Okay. And we had another question up front. Oh, there. Good morning, Sergeant Major. This is scary. <laughs> Johnny Underwood. He, he boarded me to be a sergeant, so I'm feeling like... I, I got to report to the stand-up illustrator. You're doing good. I'm personally proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But I had a, a comment about Ukraine first. It just as you were speaking about it, I thought maybe you ought to send some Ukrainians to the Master Gunner type programs. You know, get them. You know, they're supposed to be the greatest trainers around, so maybe they should go there. But my question or my thought to you today was about Junior ROTC. I'm personally, I've spoken to quite a few of those groups, and I, I can tell you that's a bedrock, you know, get those uh, youngish type people still in high school and get them motivated to go out and do some other stuff, you know, because when I ask them the question, yeah, I'm going to join the Army, okay, or stuff like that. But the question I have is, is the program viable as presently in the present form, or does it need to be modified to reflect number one values and norms of current society and also the army. So that's my question and concern, I guess. I yeah, um, we thought we actually had, I think it was a USA, didn't we have, that was one of the topics at the solarium, I thought. Um, we, we advocated to expand. Junior yeah, ROTC. yeah, we advocated to expand the junior ROTC program. What we've seen is that locations that have a JROTC program have a higher graduation rate for high school. Not, you know, just join the military. They actually have a higher graduation rate for high school. We've also found that, you know, they are actually more likely to have joined some military service, some kind of service. So we're, we're looking to expand uh, JRO, JROTC wherever we can. The one thing that we talked about, do we need, you know, younger people to go out? So that's, that was one thing we talked about. Do you have, you know, I think one of the proposals, the captain said, well, you know, can I go be a JROTC instructor? So right now, most of the, your JROTC instructors are retired military. 
So right now we, we haven't looked to, to say, yeah, officially we want to change that, but we are consistently looking at the program. We do have to have our absolute best instructors, those retirees to go do that. They have to be of highest moral character. Um, and we got to really make sure we put the right people out there because one little hiccup out there just destroys the whole program. Um, so we really got to uh, do our best um, and we can't control all that, um, you know, because school's hire them and, and that's what they're at. But we really do need to expand the program. SMA, we have two more questions. SMA, good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Holland and I have an easy question for you. Uh, but before I ask, I'd just like to say uh, we're going to miss you as our SMA. I like the soldier to your right. You're a soldier, soldier. And in my opinion, as an old soldier, you've been ideal for this time as you've served our army. Ooh. So now for my easy question. <laughs> now for my easy question. I'm, as I said, I'm an old soldier, old armor soldier. And back in the day, I remember the expert infantry badge. And I may be the only one who doesn't know about this, but I remember the expert infantry badge as an armor soldier. I was envious because we didn't have anything for, for armor. But now we have the soldier's badge. And I may be the only one in the room who doesn't know much about the soldier's badge, but could you just explain that to us and, and how that's working in the army, please? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm extremely proud of uh, doing the expert soldier badge. It mirrors, uh, you know, the expert infantry badge. It's warrior task and battle drills. For example, you would still have to do load, fire, and reduce a stoppage of a 240 Bravo. So if you're not in the Army, you don't know what I'm talking about. I can't explain that to you. It's a machine gun. <laughs> so how to load it. So, um, so you go through those same tasks. There'll be, you know, um, you have some um, how to don your protective mask. I'm trying to filter out all the military terms. You know, put on a protective mask, take it off. Um, so you have these same tasks that you would do, but not exactly like expert infantry uh, badge. There'll be certain tasks for infantry soldiers, but then they'll just, it's common tasks that would be common to every soldier in the army. Apply a tourniquet, put on your protective mask, uh, how to fire uh, a machine gun. Um, so you'll go through a series of those tasks to the highest standard. Um, and then in the end, what we always love to do is do a 12 mile foot march. That's how we have to end everything. So, uh, so um, it's a series of mental and physical challenge tasks that are uh, basically skill level one, which is your basic uh, skill task. And it looks like things you would do in combat, react to combat, uh, react to contact. Yeah. One more. Good morning, Sergeant Major. So when you, <clears throat> when you look at the Ukraine conflict through a Sergeant Major's lens, um, particularly soldier skills, what, what concerns you? Like, what would you want me to go back as a squadron commander and tell my sergeant major we need to focus on uh, if this is on the horizon for us? Yes, I get this every once in a while. And I think sometimes we try to get real fancy. Um, if you're, you know, you said squadron, so battalion, you know, I'm artillery. Guys, so let's make sure we clear that. So, uh, so when you're uh, at a battalion or a squadron level, and people say, hey, I'm got, what do I need to do to get ready for large-scale combat? Well, I just told you, start with your basic soldier task. If you don't know how to stop, you know, a soldier from bleeding, it doesn't matter if you're in large-scale combat or, you know, a counterinsurgency, you don't know how to do your task. So start with the absolute basics, and you're an expert in your field. And the grand strategy on a large-scale combat usually is, at the division or the brigade and but at the battalion and below you need to be an absolute expert in your job and every soldier in your organization needs to know their job um, so well that we shouldn't have to worry about that and we can worry about the deep fight and long-range hypersonics and how are we going to defeat the uavs and what are we going to do with you know if the tanks all line up on one road it's pretty easy to bomb them so uh <laughs> I'm saying it sounds pretty simple to me. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think what I find is sometimes, well, I need to get ready for large scale combat. And I said, well, do you know your job in and out? So when we have to do these really hard things like fighting in all domains and cyber and economics and, and all these other things with the hypersonics, can you actually feed your soldiers? 
do they die of wounds? And, and if that's all bad, and we're going to have to stop and, and go do that because you don't know your job. So I, I would say at the squad and, and below, be an absolute expert in your field, and that will apply everywhere. And then as you get higher in the echelon, that's when we're going to really have to work on our large-scale combat. All right, Lynn. Let's give our SMA a big round of applause. Huh? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to tell you, thank you for being here. Our senior leaders, our community partners, our industry partners, and especially our soldiers. SMA, you could have been a lot of places today um, on Valentine's Day. And, I, and, of course, the SMA has got a lot of places to be on any given day. But you um, took the time to spend it with us. Do you want to? Give any closing comments? I do. Um, maybe my last one. I don't know if you'll get me here one more time for a breakfast <laughs> series, but um, I've said this a couple of times in the last two, three months. I've probably got five months left. Uh, I would just say after 35, almost 36 years, I'll, I'll retire at 36 years. Um, and I and, and what I'm really proud of is I look out and I had the leaders that you know, it got me to this point. And I don't know if I ever had a chance to actually thank Sergeant Major Underwood for what he's done for me and General Ham and General Brown. Um, and when I reflect on all of this and everything and the combat and all the things that we've done about it, he said, hey, would you do it again? And every time I get back to it, I say, I would do it 10 times over. Um, for the same reason that you all in this room have served, I would do it for the American people. Uh, for those people that are walking down D.C. that have no idea how safe and protected they are um, because of what we have done. And when people say, would you do it again? And I reflect at my service, I would do it over and over and again for the American people, for the people in this room, uh, and for the people that are going to follow behind us. So thank you, and uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time as the Army. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, before we go, a couple announcements. So, we got some upcoming events that I want you to know about. On the 11th of April, our next coffee series is going to be with the Undersecretary of the Army, of the Honorable Gabe Camarima. And just after that, we have the Deputy Chief of Staff of the Army for G9, which is going to be uh, Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen on the 24th of April. And you need to mark your calendars because Global Force is back this year, and it's 30, 28 through 30 March in Huntsville, Alabama. And lastly, I want to thank our sponsors, Leonardo DRS, Northrop Grumman, and General Dynamics, because we simply couldn't do this without our sponsors. And there's one more group of people. That's our members. Ladies and gentlemen, membership helps put on performances like this today and helps us put on future events that support our soldiers and their families. So if you're a member, thank you for your membership. But if not, you have many ways to join today and no excuses because membership is free. So sign up here today, this morning, or online at AUSA.org. Thanks again for being here on Valentine's Day. We wish you all the best.